Hey, hey everyone, it's Sleepy Reader, and I am a week late. I have a stack of 14 comic books that I want to give you my comic book thoughts on, do a little countdown, uh, ranking them very subjectively by my enjoyment of them at the time I read them. Uh, but I was not able to get my comics this Wednesday. These are the comics from the Wednesday before that, from two weeks ago. I am about 3,000 miles away from my local comic book shop, so uh, sometime early in the week I'll be able to pick up my comics and try to catch up because I, I am sort of caught up, but I don't want to get behind again. But with um, Thanksgiving here in the U.S. and then Christmas time coming up, there's a good chance I'll keep falling behind yet again. So anyway, I still enjoy giving you my thoughts on comics that are a whole two weeks old. And um, so coming in at number 14 was Superman Up in the Sky, issue 5. If this weren't just a six-issue little run, I would drop this. Um, Tom King, the writer on this, just... I don't think he knows what to do with Superman. He just... And maybe he doesn't know what to do with superheroes if he's just trying to tell a superhero story. Um, if he's deconstructing them like with the vision in Mr. Miracle, I think he does a great job. But when, when it's supposed to really be about the superheroes as superheroes, I, I think he doesn't know what to do. Um, so he just plays all these riffs and these little gimmicks and doesn't really get anywhere and doesn't pin down the character at all. Um, although he thinks he's pinning down the character, I guess. But so I, I had to struggle to get through this book. And at number 13 was Legion of Superheroes. I enjoyed this more, but there was kind of an expectation in my mind that it would, um, it would give me some sense of real start, starting to understand what was going on in uh, Legion Millennium, the two-issue prelude to this issue, which just followed the character Rose and Thorn, who's one person, uh, through the deck through the centuries until she meets up at the Legion and says I have something important to tell you and In this issue she tries to talk to the Legion in a panel or two and they don't pay attention to her And that's all that we get of her here and we get kind of a scattered shot of Some kind of plot going on on another planet. I can't even remember now. <laughs> I read this earlier I read this pretty early on I just remember being kind of disappointed. And then we got a bunch of stuff where, you know, oh, oh, I know, the plot revolves around finding Aquaman's trident, which could be interesting. I don't really know much about Aquaman's trident. Is it really that special? Um, or is it just symbolic? And then we just, or is it just symbolic to people in the future? And then we just get a lot of scenes with Superboy and the Legion. And the Legion seems to be fully formed already. Although it seems also supposed, with that Rose and Thorn thing, supposed to be something about the formation of the Legion. And is Rose and Thorn supposed to have somehow influenced the, the future and the form of the Legion? None of that's clear to me at all. Um, and it's just kind of frustrating. And so there's a lot of these big moments, but they just seem like little dots on a string rather than a real story. Um, and another DC book <laughs> down low. Um, starting to enjoy them more, though. Uh, issue number three of Inferior Five. I've come to accept this is not the Inferior Five that I know. And now I'm accepting that there's a character named Tasmanian Devil. <laughs> and apparently this is not Starro, but something like Starro, if I understand correctly. Still, still loving the art. Um, and I think they finally give us a little more of the big picture in this story about how these people got to this nearly deserted, rundown city and explaining the fact that all their parents have disappeared and, and that the, the fifth one of them always gets killed and then another fifth one shows up. Still pretty mysterious. I'd say all of these things at the bottom of my pile, uh, bottom rankings, uh, they often just lack in enough information, enough clarity of story that often holds me back. Uh, it's because I really want to like this because of the art. And actually kind of the same problem with Capra in at number 10. 
um, it's kind of a struggle just to piece together what's going on. And then when you do piece it together, in this case, it's it seems like just more business, more stuff. I feel like maybe I could have just read the first few trades of the original Capra and left it at that. Maybe it's just going to keep repeating itself without really going anywhere beyond a certain point. Um, maybe it's fun just in the issues where his art is particularly unusual and cool. Uh, maybe it's good enough just for that. This issue has less of those cool wow moments than some some of his Capra issues. I'm. It's all written and drawn and colored by Michael Fife, which is why I just talk about him. Um, anyway, it was mildly interesting, but it did not wow me. In at number 10 was Crone, and this was another case of kind of expectations versus what it really was. Um, it's about an old lady who used to be a hero. In fact, we see her as kind of a Red Sonia type of character um, in this sword and sorcery, sword and sandals kind of world. And now she's retired and she's an old lady living in the woods. But she doesn't even seem that much of an old lady because we first see her battling a bear. She just seems kind of cranky. Now she's gray haired and doesn't wear skimpy clothing. But she doesn't, it just doesn't feel like, it just feels like the typical story where they come to the old hero because we need you to fight again. And, and that old hero says, no, I'm not going to fight. I, those days are over for me and I'm not going to do it. And that's pretty much what this issue is about. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I think like most Dark Horse series, this is just a mini series. And I'll probably keep getting it, at least try one more issue because I kind of like the sword and sorcery stories. Okay, here is at, no, wait, so that was, uh, <laughs> pardon me, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, is that right? And in at number nine is everything, and this is hard to talk about because I don't know what's going on in it. I think there may only be one more issue. It's written by Christopher Cantwell, who did the very good, um, she Could Fly, was that what it was called? I think it was called She Could Fly. And, um, and this one has kind of cool art by this I.N.J. Culbard. Does he do the coloring too? Because the coloring is impressive. Yeah, I think he does the coloring too. And so it's a very mysterious story about some kind of magical evil or maybe science fictional evil Walmart-like store called Everything that comes to town in 1981 and changes everything in town, I suppose. There's all kinds of mysterious stuff. And it, it's kind of okay to have mysteries that are slowly unraveling, but they double down on the mysteriousness by making it mysterious to figure out what is going on. You know, sometimes we have these very silent pages, which I think are kind of cool. You know, that's kind of cool paneling and yet it doesn't quite work. It doesn't quite tell you what you need to know. You can go back several times and try to figure it out. And yet I'm intrigued. So I kind of rank this higher than over some other ones. I was kind of pleased by the artwork and by some of the mysteriousness. It's a bit like watching a David Lynch movie or something to a degree. Um, I'm slowly figuring out some things about some of the characters and sorting out who the characters are. But again, if this is the second to last issue, it's hard to imagine that I will have it all sorted out by the last issue. So we will see. Then um, that was number eight. Everything was number eight. At number seven was Dragonfly, Dragonfly and Dragonfly Man. And I really enjoyed the original Wrong Earth that this is based on. I, I see they mention it down here, which is helpful, um, which had a Batman-like character from a happy Batman TV show, 1966 type of world, and a Batman from a dark, grim, morally corrupt world, perhaps a la Frank Miller or a little beyond Frank Miller. Um, and they switched places, and I can't remember how it all resolved. I actually thought one of the sidekicks died um, 
but both the sidekicks are alive now. Maybe I'm remembering wrong how things got resolved. Or maybe this takes place before, beforehand. Um, so it's just a beginning of an adventure where we flash back and forth following the two dragonfly characters in their two different worlds, and there's no intersection yet. Um, there might be kind of a, a theme going on of moral corruption because there's a character in the brighter, shinier, nicer world that has a machine that will morally corrupt you and turn you evil. So it, it remains to be seen where they're really going with this one. I don't feel quite as excited about it as I did when I was reading Wrong Earth. So it came in at, what did I say, number eight. Is that right? I keep losing track of this. Yeah, coming in at number seven was King Shazam. I think a one-shot. Uh, it got stuck in my pile because I'm have pulling Shazam. And I guess I was irritated when I first saw it there, but I was just happy to get Joe Bennett art. Joe Bennett, the artist from Immortal Hulk. I don't know how he has time to also be working on this one-shot uh, King Shazam, but now that I'm kind of attuned to Joe Bennett's artwork from the Hulk, it's fun to see it elsewhere. And it was, you know, a, it's kind of a simple story where Shazam has gone evil and he goes around and beats up various mythological people like Atlas and Ares, etc. So it's just kind of an action issue, kind of a stepping stone to whatever their larger Year of the Villain, the infected storyline is. And it ends on a cliffhanger. But I am... I don't know, maybe I someday I'll read a lot of this year, the villain stuff in uh, trade from the library or something, but I'm not gonna run out and get a whole bunch of issues. But definitely the Joe Bennett art did not disappoint and there was nothing in the story that jarred me. So it was just, you know, it was fun enough to read. The writer is Cinna Grace. I don't think I've read anything written by him before. And he worked at Marvel, I think on Iceman and then he was publicly dissing Marvel, so I'm kind of surprised DC would hire someone who publicly disses his editors after the fact. But who knows? Who knows how these things actually work in the, the real world of comics? But um, yeah, a lot of fun superhero fights. <laughs> in at number six was Savage Avengers, which is also just a stepping stone in their larger story with that is continuing with this evil wizard, what's his name, Cullen Gath or something. So we get more parts moving forward, the Brother Voodoo part, the Conan part, and the, um, and the Electra part, with new artist Patrick Zercher, who I like, but I'm finding his art, as I did when he was doing the Conan, Savage Sword of Conan, three issues he did, a little stiff it's like it's almost like he's self he's developed this nice style but he's a bit self-conscious about it i don't know i wish his art were a little looser somehow in terms of the figure work a cool thing is that and i don't quite understand how but conan eventually discovers he was in some virtual reality or fake reality um, inside this dome and he comes out of the dome and finds himself in lativeria and then it seems like he and Dr. Doom are kind of making friends. <laughs> I don't know if that's correct, but they're at least uh, managing to get along. Um, if the meal is subpar, I would deserve it. He's telling, oh, he says, uh, and if the feast is lacking, then by Krom, I will slay you in your own castle. And Doom says, if the meal is subpar, I would deserve it. And whom am I inviting into my home? Conan, call me Victor. Welcome to Doomstopped. So, uh, yeah, a bit of a spoiler there. I apologize. Uh, and then they got this cool map showing Conan's journey. So it kind of feels like this should be called Conan and the Savage Avengers. And even the whole calling these, these people don't call themselves the Avengers. They don't consider themselves in the Avengers. They're just a group of characters who have intersecting adventures. Um, I'm a bit surprised at myself that I'm still, I've stuck with it now for seven issues because I originally thought the idea of bringing Conan into the Avengers was nuts, but it's proved fun and uh, 
Jerry Duggan is a writer who can sometimes surprise me with his uh, ability to make fun pulp really work in comics. And speaking of Conan and pulp in comics, we've got the last issue of Berserker Unbound by Jeff Lemire with art by Mike Diodato Jr. I would say Diodato Jr.'s art at this point isn't really continuity so much as a series of uh, set illustrated set pieces. So like even where it's divided up into panels, it's really more like illustrations than you know continuity that you follow panel to panel. Um, you could look at this page in any form in a way. Uh, but it's kind of cool looking. And I suppose there are some pages that, that would count as true continuity. But, but what this, the flaw in this, so what is this? This is at number six, I guess. or No, this is, we're at number five. The flaw in this is not a real flaw, but it's a very short story stretched out for four issues. I could definitely see it being told in one issue or maybe one slightly large size issue back in the um, good old days of comics. Um, it's, it's very simple and very stretched out, but it, it was a satisfying ending. It was kind of cool. I won't spoil that. So if you can pick up all four issues cheaply or get a hold of the trade, it'll make a fun, quick read if you like stuff about barbarians and sword fights and stuff. Okay, the final four. I had trouble deciding what order to put things in, but I put Undiscovered Country in at number four. I liked it. I thought the writing was really good. I thought the coloring was really good. I'm not a super fan of um, Giuseppe Camincoli. For, for whatever reason, his artwork leaves me a little flat. But it was a cool science fiction story idea where the United States has shut itself off from the world entirely, you know, electronically, physically, in every way for, I think, 30 years. And now the rest of the world is suffering from these horrible plagues. And someone from the U.S. invites them to come visit and says, we have a cure for these horrible plagues. You just need to come here and negotiate with us or something. And so a group of people helicopters into the U.S., and but then their helicopter gets shot down and craziness ensues and the world they find inside the US doesn't seem like an organized government at all but it also seems like a fantasy world I mean, we've got people riding around on fish here and other things like that so it's almost like a cross between Mad Max and Lord of the Rings or something I don't even know so that part is potentially could lose me or potentially could turn out to be really fun. I My first reaction is I don't like this fantasy mixed with uh, this, what I, a science fiction scenario that I thought was really cool. Um, maybe there'll be science fiction explanations for everything like the floating f fish and, and all of that stuff, but it feels like we're in kind of a Lord of the Rings fantasy world at the moment. So hard to tell where it's going. The, the colorist, um, Matt Wilson is a great colorist, but I don't know. I feel like he hasn't rescued the art as much as he has for some other. <laughs> rescued is the wrong word because usually he's working with pencilers that I like more. Um, anyway, interesting book. Uh, I'll probably keep getting future issues. It's not on my pull at the moment, but and boy, do they give you a lot for, you know, because it's an image book and a first issue. They don't charge you extra. They just, they just give you a lot of material. Um, along with like 30 pages of story, there's all kinds of back matter on the creation of the comic and everything like that. So I really appreciate that. In at number three, I put The Immortal Hulk number 26. I think I'm feeling a bit of whiplash after Immortal Hulk 25 that took us into the far future and the universe was being destroyed and now we're back to our ongoing story. But again, a sense of whiplash because there is some sort of continuing of the story, but there's also a lot of conversations and lecturing about this idea that, um, that humanity is past its time 
because certain humans just work to profit off of disaster and don't care about the long term. And that's a good point, but they just kept hammering it over and over again. And so it got a little bit on the tedious side. It's the first uh, um, Immortal Hulk where I got a little bit like, hey, you've given me too much on this thing and let's move on to, to the rest of the story. But not, in, not terribly bad. You know, um, hopefully this is just this one issue and we're not, we're not going to be over-lectured about things too often. I don't mind being lectured a little bit, but I, I, I don't like it when it gets too much. And we got a cool reveal of someone else who's being added into the plot. Do I want to say? I guess I'll leave that as a surprise just in case anyone has not read Hulk 26 yet. And it was great to see Joe Bennett back on the art. So I, in one week, I got to read two comics with Joe Bennett art. Um, so that's, that's pretty amazing. Okay, in at number two. This one was hard to place. I finally decided I really liked it. Ruby Falls is this quirky murder mystery in this quirky town called Ruby Falls. Um, and it involves a girl and her family. It took me a while to figure out how old people were. I think the girl is maybe only 18 or 19 or 20. Um, and she has a friend who wants to become a circus aerialist. And I guess she's considering doing that too. Or maybe it's her girlfriend. I don't know. So there's a little bit of confusion, but there's lots of interesting quirky characters. It's got, to, to an extent, it, it's, it's written by Anne Nocenti, and to an extent it leans on, you know, murder mystery, quirky town kind of movie cliches. Occasionally it transcends that, but a lot of times it leans heavily into that. Um, but I still enjoyed it quite a bit. I think it's only four issues, too, so we're halfway through. Yes, there's number two of four. And I really liked the coloring. The artist is pretty good, but it's this kind of just a bunch of thin lines and not much detail. But I really enjoyed the colorist choices. Lots of bright daytime stuff. Um, you know, you don't see that many comics leaning so heavily into kind of a yellow palette, if you will. I don't know if that's showing up on the screen. And the colorist is Lee Lowridge, who I knew was a good colorist, but I couldn't remember what I've seen his work on before. Um, and maybe I haven't seen his work so much recently. But anyway, Lee Lowridge really helped, helped this one out a lot. So, fun one to keep an eye on if you want something, you know, totally outside of the superhero world. But my number one book was DC. It was Batman, Batman Universe. It was Brian Michael Bendis, who wrote one of my least favorite comics of the week. He wrote my favorite comic of the week. Although I think... It's that, first of all, he's doing this one just for fun. It was originally in those Walmart comics, the same as the Tom King Superman. Bendis, when he's just having fun, does get superheroes and what they're all about. And this is what they really are all about, not what he's doing in Legion or Superman, but what he's doing in this Batman universe. Um, a fun, wild adventure. But it, we've got here we've got incredible top-notch art and coloring by Nick, Nick Darrington on the art and Dave Stewart on the coloring. So you just have such a charming story. Um, or they, they add so much charm to this story. Um, they take a good Bendis story and they make it great, I think. I think there's one more issue on this. And this one really feels like there is a story that's been building up in all these issues. So I highly recommend Batman Universe. Um, it'll be wrapping up in one more month. The only gripe with both the, um, the, the ones that are the reprints of the Walmart books, this extra dollar for two extra pages from an average 20-page comic to a 22-page comic, I don't, I, I feel like it's a slap in the face a bit from DC, and yet I'm buying two of them. But um, I think I was, it was worth buying this one and not, not at all worth buying the Tom King one. Anyway, so that kind of wraps it up. I um, will be flying out from Connecticut, where I am right now, in a few hours. Um, and then I'll pick up my comics actually tomorrow, so we'll see how much time I have to read them and whether I can get back on doing the comic book thoughts. 
maybe will I have to skip a batch of comics or can I squeeze in both batches of comics um, soon? So I hope you're all having a good time and I'll talk to you later. Could you give us more details? Oh, is that all it is? Is it something philosophical? Or is it more kind of a mathematical problem? Or is it just about food? Hmm. We need to get that to the bottom of this issue. Yeah. Yes, we do. We really need to get to the bottom of this issue.